morning good afternoon good evening wherever in the world you are i'm back on yogis that inspire and before we start make sure you're well hydrated so you know grab a glass of water um grab some fresh fruit i've got watermelon here because it's really hot here in london so i always love hydrating myself with fruit and hello people are coming um i'm really excited to have basanti here with me quest hopefully this works and let me just see except Hi. <laughs> I'm all crispy. I've, I've got a fan here, as a, a sort of makeshift fan, I should say. It's a letter, and I've got water, and I'm keeping very, very cool somehow. I don't know how. <laughs> Windows open, blinds down. <laughs> yes. Um. Versanti, before we start, can you speak a bit louder into the microphone? So, Absolutely. or maybe I'll just turn up my volume. Hold on. Yeah. Okay. So, a bit louder. I have to do with the fact that I've got my phone standing on this uh, little, um, yeah, on the, on a stand. But can you hear That's me right now? Perfect. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. And also, I remember we can do Sitali breathing. If you see me going, go. Like, <laughs> <laughs> cool. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited to have you because I love that you are very well educated as well and um, are able to articulate and uh, describe yoga to the academic world and its benefits. And you've studied not only like um, in university for non-yoga stuff, but you've also done a yoga diploma. Yeah. And it, and in naturopathy as well. Yeah. So um, uh, please tell us, uh, before we start, I just want to know what made you go completely into a diploma in yoga and naturopathy? Um, you know, yeah, it's interesting how, how life works, isn't it? I think some people have plans and they might know that from age 10 onwards or something. And I thought yeah. when, when I first started university, I was 18 years old and I wanted to be an actress on stage because my family, my mum's side of the family is, is very sort of stage oriented, opera singers and pianists and actors. So I just thought that was my path because no one else in my family in, in that core family was doing it. And my mum had promised her um, grandmother on her deathbed that she would become an opera singer. So I thought this was my path and this was what I was gonna do. So when I started university, I didn't really think that I you know, I just kind of did it to appease my father because he said, oh, you're very good at mathematics. You should study mathematics. And I was like, OK, well, I'll have a look at what I can do. But actually, I wanted to be on stage. And um, yeah, so I didn't really take it seriously. And I was surrounded by many people who were very sort of competitive and who knew exactly what they wanted to do in life. And I thought I knew what I wanted to do, but I didn't feel right there. And then yeah. I saw found my way into this and, um, and realized actually maybe this is not my way of expressing myself. My way of becoming creative is not being on stage, but doing mm -hmm. something else. Um, but in the meantime, I, yes, I studied and um, went um, sort of abroad with my studies as well, where I did a little bit of something else um, because I was sort of, you know, awarded a scholarship where people didn't actually want you to study a lot and, and bury yourself <laughs> behind books, but actually be there and do stuff, be with the university community. So that was very nice. I was very lucky. And, um, and after that, I still, after my studies, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. So I meddled a little bit in the film industry. I wrote some scripts and I created a children's television series. And I also um, started working at the European Union. That was my first sort of proper job after university. And that wow. also for me. So I, it took a long time for me to find what I wanted to do. And for a long time, I thought it was being a writer. And, and that is, you know, that is one way of expressing myself. And it still is. So I still do that on the side. Um, but the life of a writer was maybe not what I wanted. And at some point, I realized that it was too much uncertainty. And you hardly ever get paid. You spend a lot of time on something. You pour your heart into it. And then nothing comes out of it. And I found that quite frustrating. And often I... Um, I would take jobs on for the money, but not because I believed in that actual project. So mm -hmm. I just 
I don't want to make these compromises anymore. And round about the same time, my sister um, also had had enough of her job because she'd been in it for about 10 years and, um, you know, had two children. And after the second one, that job, the whole role that she had changed completely. Mm -hmm. And and both of us were saying, well, why don't we start a business together? Which for me wasn't a big thing because I was already having my own business and, you know, mm -hmm. sort of for someone and earning, um, you know, the same amount of money every month. And for her, it was a little bit different, you know, with children, a husband, a mortgage. Um, but we sort of let that idea, you know... Um, Ruminate. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah. we get along so well, it just made sense to do something together. And um, I think for a long time, neither of us wanted to make money from yoga because for us, we were brought up with it. It was not something that you make money from. It's, it was something very, uh, very private, very family um, and personal as well, um, but not something that we felt we should make into a business. But then we looked around us and, and we saw that what, we, what was on offer wasn't really something that we would offer. And I guess that's where the idea came from. We just wanted to help the corporate world. We wanted to actually give hands-on advice to people physically, but also, you know, the mental side of things and how stressful the corporate world is, not just in London, but I think especially in London. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. That's and where... congratulations, I must say, that you you and your sister for Patak Yoga won the best boutique corporate well-being in Greater London, provider yeah. in Greater London. <laughs> yeah so whatever you've put your mind to you've just excelled and <laughs> I'm happy that you um, are still excelling and being recognized for um, your brilliance and your uh, wisdom and to share that on my page as well because that's what I loved not only your asana class your, your class but also how you spoke about yoga I found that very inspiring and I just couldn't wait to come back to every single class but it just couldn't be in the country <laughs> yes now you're no longer there and I haven't seen you in months <laughs> um so shall we get started with the first question that um it's simple but what is yoga <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> yeah um, yeah what is yoga i think there's two things to this question one is what is yoga and then maybe what it is to me um yeah. and so i and i'm going to ramble a little bit so feel free to um to stop me whenever but okay. i learned my father when i was very little so yoga was always a part of my life um so to me it is life it is um it's a part of my life. It's it's a part of my character, I think, and mm -hmm. it it's humility. It's 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 duty as well. It's discipline. Um, so, you know, hatha yoga or hatha yoga, as it's pronounced in the UK, and maybe in some parts of India as well. So th there's certain parts of India that that add an R at the end of everything. But actually, hat yoga would be the pronunciation, and hat means forceful. It means strict. So it is that discipline that that comes from hat yoga, I think. Um, and um, yeah, so to me, um, hat yoga or yeah, hat yoga is not a style of yoga. Um, it, it's a path that you're on, and that's the path that I'm on. And um, it's it's a path towards, for want of a better word, enlightenment, um, and asan and pranayam, which I started with. So actually, I started with pranayam when I was very little because my father was working, um, you know, came from India from a beautiful you know, from the hills, the untouched nature, and came into to Germany where he met my mom and then married and was surrounded by industry. And he was working um, in his uh, semester holidays. He'd studied physics and then he um, he was working at a lab at um, Biolanxess. So he was, you know, exposed to a lot of fumes, a lot of chemicals. And mm. he did so when he developed asthma, he remembered yoga, which he had learned from his grandfather and just sort of forgot, you know, because young people out and about and experience the world. And he just kind of left that. Um, so then he remembered um, yoga and pranayam and he started teaching us because he sort of rediscovered this and said, I must teach my daughters. Um, so pranayam was my first entry into yoga. Then came asan. And asan is... Um, it is stillness of the body. It is, it is essentially that. It's, it's the stillness of the body in order to achieve stillness of the mind. And our breath helps us with that. So 
it just mm. still the mind, the mental fluctuation, all that mind chatter, the monkey mind, as the Buddhists call it. So we use the body, but we don't get stuck in the body. And I think when you ask many people what yoga is, they will focus on asan. They won't call it asan or asana. Maybe they will. But they will focus on the physical side of things. But this mm -hmm. is something transcending that is the essence of yoga it's it's that path of transcending the body we're moving beyond the body and um in hat yoga we're focusing and that is what i um, did and what yoga is for me we're focusing particularly on the subtle body on on energy so on pran or you can call it chi you can um, speak about kundalini as well which all is in that same um, realm and um, we're looking at nadis the energy channels and how they work and asana and pranayama are part of this but they're not an end um, in itself so uh, we all know that um we can change our psychology and our physiology through posture, through asana. But that is just the start. And what we're actually changing ultimately is the chemistry of the body with all the natural um, opioids, our, our own pleasure chemicals that we have, and the architecture of the brain. We're changing the architecture of the brain as well so that we can achieve liberation. And that liberation that might sound a little bit too spiritual, but it is quite, um, it is very um, concrete as well. It's, it's the liberation from our body, the way that we see our body, that we get so caught up in what is happening to us. So it's our ego, it's our attachment, um, the things we want, the things we hate. So we try to transcend all of that, liberate ourselves from all of the stuff that we don't need, especially in a society in any society these days, unless we're in the middle of nowhere and we've kind of swap, sworn off all of these things, we are so much part of this Western world, in our case, um, that, we, that it's quite um, hard to really release all of that. So this is harder for us than it would be for people uh, 200 years ago, and then it would be for monks who have never been exposed to this. So, um, uh, and this is where often people um, cite yoga as being unity. And this is where the unity comes in for me. So unity with, of our body with other people in our life, in this world. Um, and that is in, in the microcosm. It's the unity between the right and left. If we put our hands to Anjali Mudra, yeah. it's the unity between the, um, the right and left hemisphere of the brain, the way that everything, all the nadis are either nadi or pingal nadi. So these two nadis, our nostrils, work in unison to, um, to influence the different hemispheres of the brain and make sure that we don't have any mental issues. So all of this is the unity of the body. But then there's the unity of seeing that everything that we have in the body is something that we find outside of the body. Everything that is us is nature and everything around us is nature. So, uh, and I think this is where if we accept that and if we recognize that, where we see why there is so much, um, why there are so many health issues in the world these days, because what we do um, when we go away from what our true nature is, is we go against our nature and we create these problems inside ourselves. And then we make it worse by adding chemicals to the body, which are also unnatural, rather than seeing maybe the, the natural side of things. So that would be my, my um, you know, the yoga, but also the naturopathy degree of just seeing the body as a whole and, um, and, and seeing the similarities between us and them. And them doesn't have to be people. It's just anything that we distinguish ourselves from. So ultimately it's a way of becoming signless and not distinguishing anymore, but seeing the similarities. That's a very long answer. <laughs> oh, I love that. And what it makes me think of as in, you know, I used to think of my home as just my home, but now I think of the world as an extension of my home. Yeah. And wherever I go, like... So much. It just probably is for you very nice right now because you feel very safe no matter where you are because you know that it doesn't matter where you are. Yes, it's a feeling now more than anything, a feeling of home mm -hmm. um, to create that. And where... And so that through yoga practice has helped me. So I, I'm, I'm relating a little bit to what you're saying about that. It's such a great explanation, as someone said. And uh, Kartu143 asked, Tish, if you could share some info about kundalini energy. I know that's a different di um, path in yoga, but still mm -hmm. um, yoga. I don't know what he meant by that, but um, do yes. you have any thoughts? Yes, that's fine. Absolutely. Um, so when we talk about energy, there's, there's different um, 
ways I suppose to talk about it. There's the um, there's the way that we can um, describe this energy as Kundalini, Pran, Chi, or whatever it is, and a path of Kundalini is exactly the right way to put it. So it's not that we are um, practicing just Kundalini Yoga. It sits um, within the Yoga tradition, and um, uh, the the way that I would describe it. Um, is maybe maybe let's start in a scientific way maybe that is something that we haven't heard so much yet and i always think science brings it back to the way that we've been brought up in the west so i'll try that um <laughs> maybe let me give an example of meditating um so when we meditate what happens in meditation is um, or what can happen in meditation is that the brain eliminates the structures of complexity that it's created, that the prefrontal cortex, so the, the um, CEO of the brain, so to speak, the youngest part of the brain and the one that we're sort of making decisions with and that's quite active all the time. So this is a, a very intricate structure, very complex. And um, when we meditate, this complexity is being eliminated and we're trading energy that is usually used for this cognitive function for a heightened awareness um, for heightened attention. And this is one way of describing Kundalini. So we might have little um, uh, specks of Kundalini that we see here and there. A Kundalini can be heightened, we hear that a lot. I don't quite know what that means when people say it. I have also said it before, but this is also, this is also a way of um, uh, taking yoga into the um, way of speaking. You know how people say, hello yogis and yoginis, and they won't mean everyone here is a yogi. Yeah. No one is a yogi. Hardly anyone is. A, there are yogis, but I am not a yogi. But sometimes people say hello yogi, hello yogini, and that's okay. And in that same way, sometimes I will say, um, "Oh, you have very heightened kundalini." If someone texts me and I have thought about them at that particular moment, that <laughs> maybe like, our kundalini is heightened on here on Instagram. Yes, exactly. <laughs> And in a way, that is also, that's a very good of, um, way of describing it as well. So now that we're having this conversation and we're being joined by other people, we are having um, a conversation about the same thing. And our brains are now working in similar ways. So the neural passageways that we're using are, are similar, are the same. And our brains are connected through this. And that is also Kundalini. So, um, yeah, so um, you can find Kundalini through any different path. Kundalini can be a path. Hat yoga can be a path, um, or marg, marg is what, it, what that's um, called in Sanskrit. Um, and, and many other, you know, kirtan, um, raja yoga, um, all of these can be a path. And all of these are paths towards that liberation, towards enlightenment. And that kundalini is our channeling of these energies. And um, it is a very, very um, complex thing to explain. I find. I'm sure other people could do a much better job of that. Um, You're doing really well. <laughs> Thank you. I'm understanding. I don't even know what Kundalini is. I, I, do, I practice a little bit, but I'm like, it's all like with the arms swinging yeah. and like this. That's the other thing. So I think you can find Kundalini in everything. You can find it in meditation. You can find it in chanting. You can find it in an asana practice. And um, one of the ways that I learned was actually through this very ancient part of Hatha Yoga, um, Kundalini Kriyas. And they are um, all exercises for the subtle body. So Kriyas, um, maybe I, I think I don't have to explain Kriyas, but let me know. No, if no. You... Yeah, don't okay. need to explain that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the process of of cleansing the body to make space for that energy that we have in the body to float freely to go through these channels and um if you you know you you teach yin as well don't you so yin is one of now these now i do <laughs> before i did it as of last month i'm qualified <laughs> well, very nice <laughs> and then yes yeah, so then you you know and this is also another way of of channeling kundalini ultimately we are going into the subtle body subtle body meaning the um the nerves the fascia the the spaces between what we can tangibly feel and and actively stretch so the muscle for example um and we clear our body we cleanse it of toxins we cleanse it of um uh, um, you know, compressed areas where nothing goes through anymore. And we just, mm -hmm. we allow that energy to flow. 
So we're channeling en energy with Kundalini. And um, yeah, so yeah, that, that's, I don't know if that answered the question. Um. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That he said he understands. And there was another question um, regarding, but I thought I'll address that by Kartu about cancer. I'll address that at the end about how to diagnose cancer, like hazardous disease through yoga practice. Um, uh, is, I don't know if you want to address that now or would you like to address that at the end? I can't. I mean, I'm not an expert um, with that. But what I would say is based on Ayurveda and naturopathy um, is that ultimately the source of any illness is the same. It is, um, it, it's, it's an imbalance in the body between mm. our, our um, body types, for want of a better word. That's not, I, I'm trying to make it a little bit easier. Um, uh, and um, and we have different types of um, energy in our body. I'm back to energy. So there's heat in our body. And often, um, as, take heat, because this is the most common. If we have any kind of inflammation in the body, if we look at the word inflammation, then we'll already feel that there's, there's flame in this word. So yeah. there's, there's the, the heat in inflammation. If your body is inflamed, your body will be hot. Um, mm -hmm. This is why often, you know, if we're ill, we'll have a fever or a temperature. So that's one sign of it. And this um, inflammation can spark into something else, something bigger. And um, we, you know, cancer is potentially, there's obviously many different types, some benign, some not, and, and some beyond redemption. Mm -hmm. And I'm not yoga can help you with everything and i think that would be irresponsible to say but there are many things that ayurveda nature cure and yoga can do that um that all allopathic medicine cannot do um so it it depends on the type of illness that you have it depends on how far into it you are but generally our bodies as we go along and we're exposed to the life that we live and the food that we eat and many things that we maybe shouldn't be having, not just because um, our world is full of processed food, which isn't actually food. It's, it's yeah. not for our body. Um, yeah. Then um, th there's a lot of accumulation of bad stuff in the body and this can lead to illnesses. Cancer is one of those, but many others are there as well. And there are many that, you know, the reason why many of us struggle with allergies or, or with um, uh, uh, skin issues, eye fever yeah. as well, yes, is, is because of that, is because of that unnatural way of living. But we have to also accept, and I think that's important to see, is that when we, um, when we look at the life that we're leading and this, this Western lifestyle, this, this industrialized or post-industrialized lifestyle, which offers us a lot of good, but also a lot of bad stuff. When bad things happen, let's not just rely on nature because nature has not been the one to cause all of this. So maybe nature cannot be the one to treat all of this by itself. So I think that's important to, um, to keep in mind. Uh, that's there is a an excellent point. <laughs> nature did not cause all of this. So n we need not use nature to treat all of it. Yes. Yeah, because that's ultimately the, the problem is that often we feel when we're so convinced about something and I, I love yoga, I might live and breathe yoga, but at the same time, it's, it's dangerous to see it in, in its own little orbit because we're never, we're always part of what's going on around us, whether we want to or not. So the influences that the outside world has on us are something that we cannot shield ourselves from. So we have to accept that the outside world is in us and that that is also something that can help us in certain ways. In, you know, in other ways, I'm, I'm absolutely for um, trying nature cure first. But, you know, there's certain, there's certain ends to it as well. And, you know, I, I know Ayurvedic doctors, if they have, you know, the, and the ones that I know all do, they are really great. And they will tell you if they've come to the end. And they will also work with you on, say, you are full of, your body is full of medication. They won't suddenly tell you, stop all your medication and just focus on me. Because that would be not the right way. You need to mm -hmm. phase things out. You need to be kind to your body in that way as well because your body adjusts slowly. It's just like you wouldn't tell someone who's never done yoga or any exercise before um, to, to come into a handstand immediately or try to come into Hanumanas and into the splits um, without yeah. any warm-up, without any 
preparation of, of weeks to get the body ready. So um, it's, it's all a path towards health and, and liberation. Yes, well said, and a lot of comments so well explained. Yes, yes, no, they are, and they're saying thank you so much for the explanations, and they're really, they're like, thank you, ma'am. <laughs> they're really appreciative. <laughs> um, they were, and speaking of that, someone just asked, you know, what what would you recommend for a beginner to do yoga? And like you said, um, you know, just what well, you just answered that question, I believe. But if you have anything extra to add, yeah. I would, um, I mean, this is, um, I feel that yoga is so personal um, and so individually different. I sometimes think you could teach a class. So, so one thing I, I would say is I never prepare a class. I don't think I've ever prepared a class in my life because it doesn't make sense to me because the people in front of me are always different and I need mm -hmm. to be able to react to them and what they want and read that. And that's my my task in, in a class um, and that's why I think when people prepare classes um, maybe that is their way of doing what they feel is a good class and maybe they can still make deviations from it if they feel that they need to so I'm not saying that's not good for me that's not my way but say in a theoretical world someone prepared a class for two people to teach, these two people would teach a completely different class just because of who they are and how they, um, how they explain things. So you could ask a class to do a sequence of, um, you know, um, the Virbhadras and the, the warriors, and you could do Trikonasan and Parivritsikonasan, the, the, tri, um, the triangles. Um, you could take them into Sarvangasan, into a shoulder stand and do all the different sequences of it. You could do exactly the same or be asked to do exactly the same. But the end result would be completely different because of who you are teaching and also because of who everyone is in front of you, how they affect you and how you affect them. So it's, again, the finding the unity in a class as well. Um, so for a beginner, I would suggest trying many different classes and finding a teacher who's right for you because the connection has to be there. And that mm -hmm. connection is much more important than what you actually do. So back to, um, we are really transcending the asan. We could be in any asan. And um, I might have said that in one of my classes to you in person. Um, yeah. One of my gurus would stand in Vrikshasan in the tree pose uh, at, until a very, very late age. And he was already very old when, when I first learned from him. And I was maybe 14, 15. Um, and he would just do this asan, just Vrikshasan. But Vrikshasan can be everything. It can be encompassing all of yog because it's not just, oh, I'm standing in this posture. So... The difference would be standing in front of a, um, a doing window shopping, looking at, at a pullover and in a window and thinking, oh, I quite like this and everything. And your mind is there. Your mind is not where you're standing. You could be in Taras, feet together, arms by your sides, maybe palms to the front, but you're not practicing yoga. And no matter what posture you choose to adopt, it can be yoga or it cannot be yoga. And you need to find a teacher who will bring that to you, who will bring yoga to you, rather than just the physical side of it. And mm -hmm. I think that's the challenge, because very often I find that maybe people will look only for the physical side. And maybe that's okay for them, because maybe that's where they are at this moment in their life. And maybe after that can come more, can come that focus on the breath, once their body is maybe a little bit more flexible, maybe it's easier for them to think about what is going on here and what is going on down in the belly and maybe feeling what is going on in the heart. And after that, maybe there is more to you. So everyone has their own path. And just like, I think, I'm not sure which, who said it, but there is an author who said there are as many Indias as there are Indians. And I feel that way <laughs> about yoga as well. Indian. There are yogas and parts of yoga as there are people practicing yoga so mm -hmm. because the path to freedom can be anywhere and ultimately religions want that path to freedom as well so everyone i think is striving to get to that point because that is the ultimate happiness 
you know, there's, there's the sub superficial happiness that maybe riches and material goods will give you or um, validation from others. But whatever it is that maybe was lacking in your childhood as well will then be sparked later on in life. But we are looking to outgrow that with you. And um, because everyone is different and has had a different childhood and different experiences in life, this will also be a different path for them. So yeah. we might start on the same path, but go completely different. Or we yeah. might start on the path of asan practice, but that is not the same, even to begin with. Thank you for that answer. That really, um, I hope you, I think that really answered his question about finding um, how to, a beginner should approach yoga and finding the teacher that resonates um, in bringing that yoga aspect to the teaching rather than just the asana. Um, and Kartu, you asked a question about Sanskrit, but we'll get to that. So bear with me. And there's one more question from Amesh. Thank you for coming. And he says, do you recommend any particular type of yoga that is good for recovering from a knee injury? Ah, yes. Um, so I learned this um, very, um, yeah, very, very old part of Hatha Yoga, which is... Um, not very, um, I mean, it's not even very well known in India, um, let alone the West. Um, and this is, uh, like I said, exercises for the subtle body. So Suksham Vyayam, the subtle body. Um, and there are many exercises that, um, uh, or Kriyas, I should say, that mm -hmm. are very good for knee joints. Um, so one would be, maybe I can just show this as well. Oh, thank you, Basanti. Thank you. Yeah, I can move this along a little bit oh, oh yeah That's all i can do <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's perfect yeah far enough away to show so but there is also we can link to my youtube channel what to yeah. do so for the knee joints just hover your leg at the front and then a little back kick where you're going to the back and bringing the knees into one straight line so a gentle breath to the front inhale yeah. And then exhale and go back and quite forcefully and you'll feel not just the um the strength of the knee but it also strengthens your hamstrings and your calf so when we focus on any part of the body it's obviously connected to many other parts of the body so we want to see this as a whole as well so this would be one i call it yogic butt kicks this is not the um <laughs> the i love that i'll do yogic butt kicks or i'll kick your butt <laughs> <laughs> but the, the long one is such a mouthful. But this is one of the um, one What's of the, the very long one. I'm just is that a Sanskrit name for yogi butt kicks? <laughs> yes, there is. It won't be called that. So these um, uh, kriyas are all um, a, a composite. So all of them end with shakti vikasak, which means okay. shakti the power or strengthening vikasak. So we're strengthening a certain part of the body. So there will be. Um, Kati, shak, uh, kati Shakti Vikasak. So for the waist, for example, a strengthening of the waist. There's a strengthening of the, the wrists, the forearms, etc. Um, so we can talk a bit more about that later. Um, but so this is, the, this is the shortening of it. Kati chakra vi, chak, Shakti Vikasak. <laughs> now I can't even. That's a tongue twister. I'll have to ask you to spell it later. I'm like, what is this? But it's, in other words, yogi butt kicks. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> to make it easier for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there so must yeah, be some Sanskrit benefits to pronouncing these words. So I'm sure there's a, you know, another benefit of saying it out loud. <laughs> Just <laughs> if I want to sound professional, I'll say the whole Sanskrit. <laughs> we'll stick to Shakti Vikasik. <laughs> yeah, if anyone um, challenges me, I'm like, it's Shakti Vikasik. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so back to um, what type of yoga. Again, I think it's maybe less about the type of yoga you choose. Mm -hmm. Although with a knee injury, I would maybe not choose um, very strong vinyasa classes. Now, mm -hmm. vinyasa or ashtang yoga or rocket yoga, they all fall within that movement of asan. Movement, you know, asan and breath combined and movement. Um, that's a slightly, um, yeah, um, younger and, and maybe quite Western influenced um, part of yoga. Uh, Rocket, for example, you know, didn't originate in, um, I think originated in um, America, but correct me if I'm wrong, anyone, everyone. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> will know better because I don't practice rocket. Um, 
but um i would i would Maybe nasa invented it ah uh, yeah. okay <laughs> I don't know. I'm just guessing. <laughs> I'm just guessing. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll invent it for our astronauts, and we'll call it rocket yoga. <laughs> Maybe it's their sequence. I'm not quite sure. I think this was a. Um, so it was definitely LA. Um, was definitely America. I'm thinking LA. Um, yeah. Maybe 60s or 70s or something. Um, maybe some some celebrities involved in it. I'm not quite sure. I don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, oh, that's okay. So I would stay away from things where you're not in control. When you when you have any kind of injury, you want to make sure that any posture that you go into, any movement that you do, is fully mindful. So you're in control. You're fully aware. You're not elsewhere and thinking of something else. which can lead to you just doing things a little bit you know and we know this you know i you could hurt yourself just bashing your hands by talking with your hands or or something like that so it it happens quite quickly when we're unaware so choose a form of yoga that um where you can be aware at the all the time and sometimes and i'm not saying that when you're moving you can't be aware but i'm saying that with an injury you should be more careful slower and focusing on that injury so maybe posture asan practice rather than um, more rigorous forms of yoga until you're better oh thank you that was such a good explanation thank you and the next question i wanted to ask is oh, what is asan and i know you say asan but and some people say asana yeah. um is what is is there a correct way or is is that incorrect or what, i mean what, uh, what? i shy away from saying this is correct and this is incorrect because um you know india is a very big country <laughs> the indian yeah. subcontinent is massive and yoga is very old but if we look at sanskrit it's it is such a, so the devanagari scripture the sanskrit is devanagari scripture which is also the same script that you use when you learn hindi or right hindi um uh is very accurate and asan is so i would i would love to maybe i will write it give me one moment okay of work because um i would have to yeah. mirror up but um yeah. let me just i'm just gonna, no worries you can find it um and i just want to let you know kartu we're going to i'm going to write down that chakra name for you after and um they're saying thank you mesh says thank you for answering the question and kartu is also very grateful so yeah this is all valuable information hello mary vogue <laughs> now i'll try to do something here ah uh, yes this is an r I'll give you all of the ones that are part of the word asan. So here we've got a, s, and n. Together that would be asan. Now if we say asan na, there would be there would be a line here. That would be asan na. So um technically when we're looking at the Sanskrit, it's asan. But in um you know in different parts of India um uh and and sri lanka i think as well uh so going further south i see people add a lot of r at the end so they would say asana if you're in south india most likely you would have heard asana um you'd also hear yoga but if you're in north india um you will hear yog you will hear hat rather than hatha you will hear asan you will hear ram rather than rama um mahabharat rather than mahabharata um ramayan rather than ramayan ramayana and mm-hmm. prana rather than pranayama so this a at the end is um maybe something that one um is a regional thing but two is a western thing because it's um there is a little so the n at the end has a little a bit more than it would have in the western language an n would have so it's not quite asan it's asan so there's a slight ending that we wouldn't have i hope that translates over this um <laughs> yeah asan is that right 
Yes, yeah. So there's a little bit extra that we wouldn't have in, in other languages, in, in the English language. And um, this is maybe where it's coming from. But technically, it would be asan, it would be hot yoga rather than hatha yoga, and certainly not hatha. So this um, comes from... No, hatha, hat. <laughs> so the hatha is because in Hindi, um, there is different ways, or Sanskrit as well, we have many, many different um, sounds to that T that we have in English. Mm. So um, if you say, um, uh, have some tea, it's the same sound as um, be strict with yourself. All these T's are the same sound. In French, for example, the T is much, much softer. So if you say tu, you, uh, which means you, you would say not tu, but tu. So it's tu. not aspirated. So there's not this h huh sound at the end. And mm -hmm. um, we have ta, ta, so quite here up at the front, then tu at the back, ta, and ta. And my pronunciation isn't great. I know that. So I apologize to all Sanskrit scholars <laughs> and, and all those Indians, if there's many Indians joining here. Um, but these are... There are a few Indians. <laughs> Okay, my huge apologies. <laughs> but but I mean, my best, which is what it means. <laughs> so you see, I wasn't brought up in Hindi. And yeah. to this day, my, my father has since passed away. But my sister and I will still say, oh, we wish he had just taught us Hindi. Because it would have opened up an, another world for us, another sphere of being almost. Um, yeah. And Planted afterwards, you know, and, and you pick up things here and there as a child. And we were always in India. So it's not that I'm completely without the knowledge of Hindi, but it's not my mother tongue. And that's oh, a shame. So. I, that's the, I don't know if you can see the comments, but he, one of the, uh, someone, Kartu from India said, no, you're perfect. Uh, <laughs> and I can't read Hindi. I, th I don't know if he's writing in Hindi or if it's Sanskrit, but I, I don't understand. So apologies. I don't know if you can read it. Can you read Hindi, Basanti? Yes. So I can read Hindi. And when you read Hindi, you can also, you're also able to read Sanskrit because the, um, the scripture is the same. So it's like mm -hmm. if you're, I mean, it's, it's similar because the pronunciation is the same because Sanskrit in, or um, the Devanagari scripture is so accurate. But if you say, for example, know the English language, you would yeah. be able to read um, German, even if you don't know exactly how to pronounce because things could be pronounced mm -hmm differently in that with with that scripture in Devanagari scripture it's different so reading Hindi automatically means you can read Sanskrit so two oh, wonderful one stone <laughs> oh wow I wish I paid more attention in Hindi school <laughs> <laughs> See, I was one of my cousins um she was over from America but she's Indian and yeah. she was um, she was saying, so I am sort of refreshing my Hindi with Duolingo, um, with the app that um, that you can learn all sorts of languages with. Oh, and, nice. And she was, um, and, and I showed her something. I showed her a, a sentence and she was like, oh, you can read this? And I was like, yes, I can. I mean, obviously not as good as you. And she said, you're probably much better than me because <laughs> when she learned it when she was a little child, but then from age five or six went to other schools where it was English. It wasn't actually Hindi that was being taught. So um, a lot of that is lost and a little bit with my father as well. So he went to, um, uh, to boarding school when he was five years old, actually. And until then, of course, his mother tongue was Hindi. But from that time onwards, English became his mother tongue for, you know, the, no. the that he was most um, comfortable with. And it was only afterwards, um, because he loves poetry and he, and he wanted to find his way back in, into Hindi, being in, in an alien country, if you will, um, that he reconnected with this language and got very, very good at reading, writing and, and everything again. But um, for many Indians, that's, I think that is not the case. It's, it's a conscious choice that you have to make, I think, depending on what your education um, is, you know. I yeah. have to practice with the Indians that I know. <laughs> and I don't know if you can read the comments. He's written something in Hindi. Oh, okay. Sorry, Kartu. Maybe you can message me and I can message Basanti later about um, yes, that. that and, <laughs> yeah, I can't yes. see the comments, unfortunately. Oh, but, no worries. And, and thank you so much for answering the question in such, such depth about Asan and how to pronounce and what 
where the different pronunciations come from and what is an asan <laughs> asan is um asan is stillness of the body that is essentially what it is and that mm. is why often i find people don't allow for the asan to be held long enough to to get the full effect not just for the physical body for the the muscle to warm up safely and keep warming up and go deeper and for our connective tissue to be affected as well but also for the mind because ultimately this is where we want to get the stillness of the body has an effect on the mind and it stills the mind and you'll find in especially in balancing postures it's that's a very good example i think because there we mm -hmm. can all do we will exactly and yeah. i also, as you will know as well maybe will ask people to stand in briksh asan and close their eyes if they feel comfortable often i prefer them to bring the foot down onto the ground so that it's still balancing but easier and then close the eyes so that we're then starting to connect much more with the breath and with anjali mudra as well mudras are incredibly powerful they leave an imprint on your breath and they leave an imprint on your brain so all of these are part of asan i should say and um can be used to make this asan what the ultimate aim of it is and that is that stillness of the mind the stillness of the mental fluctuations so again not getting stuck in the body but using the body to still the mind that is asan and um we could you know there's vinyasa in general is a little bit more like um uh like gymnastics and i think this is why people love it so much because they see the effect they see how great they can get and and it makes them feel good because we're raising our body temperature we're you know we're we're going into the the sympathetic nervous system so we're we're getting um we're putting our body under stress good stress yeah. um to then relax and calm down and often you'll find um maybe especially in the current world that people need this before they can calm down because they're already having these underlying stresses and these are harder to get rid of than the stresses that we induce so there is i mean there's so many different types of stresses in there there's there's the good stress <laughs> the one that goes up and then it shoots down again there's those stresses that stay with us all the while and um and and i think um fear an internal stressor one that we might not even be aware of underlying worries that continuous anxiety that maybe all of us in this world are being exposed to because of how the world is because we're being bombarded with news and mm. with other people's lives and our community has become much bigger than it ever has been and much bigger than it ever should be much bigger than what we are able to deal with what our physical body is able to deal with that all puts a stress on the body and that changes maybe the way that we are working our body that we should do yoga because when yoga was first created and and shiv taught parvati they didn't live in our world so it's okay to change the type of yoga that you feel works for you and that lets you release those pleasure chemicals that ultimately we want um and oh, can i say one thing i find this quite it's it's more than whatever you like <laughs> no please um so um i think one of the things that um always strikes me is the physical side of yoga is i think maybe something that that people oscillate to much more than um meditation and i often find that those people and you know working in the corporate world i have a lot of clients that have become my private clients um that might be the you know some executive ceos of um their companies or something highly stressed individuals and um i often find that what they want from me is very very hardcore exercises whether that's vinyasa whether that's flowing through very tough postures whether that's very very strong uh, kundalini kriyas that i am loath to to show everybody unless i know their bodies very well because they are quite they can be dangerous as well kundalini is not something to take lightheartedly um but i find that they are not open to meditation 
it takes a long time, a lot of convincing on my part, and also kind of a bit of stealth meditation, if that's the right word. So kind of sneaking something in <laughs> <without Yeah. laughs> for them to realize this is actually what I need. And I think that is because we are so highly stressed, some people more than others, that we cannot from up here go down to there. So we need to take little steps, baby steps down those stairs rather than jumping down. That is not possible. And, um, but what happens in meditation is essentially what we're trying to do in any type of yoga. Um, and scientifically, uh, our brain releases these chemicals that heighten our focus. And that's obviously something that we want. So we, we, when we meditate and we focus on, say, the breath, or particular parts of the body. Any meditation is ultimately, in its core form, a concentration. That's the start of any meditation, concentration. Letting your mind not wander, because it does that all the time. That's called, in, in neuroscience, you'd call that the default mode network, because we are in it by default. We're in it most of the time, almost half of our life. Um, but when we focus, what happens is that our brain waves slow from very agitated, or not too agitated, depending on where we are, um, to calm. So we go from agitated beta, they look like this, to karma alpha, maybe like this. So we are relaxed, but we are still very much alert. And mm -hmm. what happens then is that large parts of our prefrontal cortex, so that brain CEO here, the young part, the one that's mostly in charge, are actually turned off. And what that does is it gets rid of our inner critic. It makes us lose our sense of self and our sense of time, which is obviously something that is sitting somewhere in the brain. Somewhere in the brain, our sense of self sits, our sense of time. And once that goes, and some of the listeners, or maybe you as well, might have experienced this inner meditation where you felt like you were floating or you were connected to the world around you. And that is a process in the brain. And when we're there, we can access fresh perspectives. And that is something that yoga does. It makes your brain capable of so much more than what we use it for. So it's our way of accessing this, but then also not getting addicted to it because we can easily get addicted to these brain chemicals. We have six very, very strong pleasure chemicals. And when we feel that, you know, it's, it's like thrill seekers. They're, they're not, you know, adrenaline junkies aren't actually, um, <laughs> ah, you know what I mean? You're not actually looking to be scared. You're looking for the release afterwards. And that is what meditation can do for you as well. Mm -hmm. Release all those endorphins and nandamides. And they also, they boost lateral thinking. Again, we can use the brain in a way that we're not usually using it. We're tapping into things that we don't normally tap into. And then comes the relaxation. Then comes the recognition. Then comes the binding, the carving of new neural path passageways. And all of that is something that you can achieve through meditation, through yoga. And you can also achieve it through crazy bouts of stress. And we're talking crazy. So you will know, maybe bungee jumping, maybe something else, or maybe just running away. You know, I diving, like maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> So I haven't do... said this with many people, but I thought, what the hell, for the people who are here, I'm, I've signed myself off to do a skydiving, solo skydiving next week. And oh, I'm so wow. scared. Oh, my God. You must and... report back to all of us. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't hear from me, you know, please uh, <laughs> bear <good>. with me. <laughs> I'm <not> checking in. <laughs> yeah. wow. <laughs> that has brought so much, like just re what you're saying, you know, reflecting back on my life. I went through phases when I was just addicted to yoga. I would just do yoga every single day and then followed by meditation. Now, not so much. I'm not so strict with my yoga practice. Um, but I would go through bouts of like 30 days, not every day. I have to do eat, sleep, yoga, work, repeat. You know, that was my schedule. Yeah. And yeah. And now I think that thrill, those, and, and you just pointed it out, which I didn't think of, is through thrill-seeking. There is a way that we do that, isn't, it? isn't there? I think um, 
it depends on, yeah, ultimately our experiences, which have an imprint on the brain, change the architecture of the brain and make us yeah. look for things that, yeah. And also, this is an interesting thing that you said you were addicted to yoga because we have this, um, I think everyone has that, these preconceived notions of what addictions are. And then we talk about, oh, well, that's bad addictions. You're addicted to drugs. Well, that wouldn't happen to me. But then maybe you consider yourself a workaholic or you're addicted to yoga, for example. And some people would say, well, that, that's fine. But any addiction has the same, the process in the same, is in the brain is the same. So if, we, if we're addicted to something and we can take ourselves away from that, even if the addiction is to something good, even if the addiction is to helping, then we might ask ourselves, why are we addicted to this? Is it the positive neurotransmitters that we feel afterwards? And can we try not to get addicted? Can we try not to make this um, a pattern? Can we stay mindful within this? Mm. I don't think that makes sense. Yes, that makes sense. Like chocolate, like I had to, I was quite overweight growing up and I had to change my um, addiction to sugar and food that didn't that I didn't know wasn't good for my well-being when I was growing up so I had to sit with myself and be like wait can I do without chips today can I do without soft drink you know can I do without these foods that were immediately pleasurable but long-term painful for yeah. my body yeah and I think that's yeah these sort of dirty discomforts are um something that we sometimes don't recognize as such because some things come disguised as, as good things and yoga is the, the perfect example of that. But we can make everything, everything, no matter what it is in life, something that mm -hmm. has a negative effect on the body. So it's mm -hmm. nice to hear that now your yoga addiction, if it was yeah. one, is, is gone. Yeah. And, more, and I'm ultimately, isn't that what we're looking for? Not getting addicted, yeah. attached to something and also not having an aversion to anything either. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure I, I'm not there, but yeah, I, I'm not there. But I will like reach up for something and be like, okay, now I'm stretching. That's my one minute of yoga. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's good. <laughs> one minute instead. But thank you so much for that explanation so, um, about, I think it was asana we were talking about. Yeah, asana. Yes, and, 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 and I, I started with Sanskrit words. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. The, that was the next question I wanted to ask is um, the pronunciation of Sanskrit words. And I think Kartu also mentioned earlier, he said um, a, about Sanskrit. I'm trying to think of to learn. Oh, I can't. I can't see. But if you can just talk about the pronunciation of Sanskrit words. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, so lots of people will say, um, I've, I've heard it a lot um, by Western instructors, um, that it is a must to say the Sanskrit word because it leaves an imprint on your brain and it is important to say that Sanskrit word. But then they pronounce it not in the Sanskrit way. And I think that might have to do with the fact that they were taught not in India, um, mm -hmm. but in the West. And there is a lot that gets um, lost in translation. So I would always tell anyone who can to learn in India, if they really want to. That doesn't mean that outside of India, everything is bad. That's not what I'm saying at all. But if you have that exposure, not just to um, the, the yoga tradition, but also to the wider culture, because India is so... Um, it, 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 I think yoga permeates through the whole culture and if you grow up in india you will you'll have lived parts of yoga already in the way that you are being brought up in the morals that you share in the way that um family as a unity is important um so i would always advise that but sorry back to sanskrit <laughs> i um, i think it is um, I, I mean i love they it, it's just nice it's like juice on your tongue when you pronounce these lovely words <laughs> but oh. I also think that you'll have to judge your audience, you know, some people, and if you're teaching in a gym, maybe people come into your class because they want just fitness. 
And maybe you are a fitness instructor. Maybe if you are a fitness instructor, you shouldn't focus too much on pronouncing these Sanskrit words, especially if you're not quite sure about the pronunciation. Now I'm saying not quite sure, but I think many people don't actually know. So um, one example would be Adho Mukh Swanasan. So uh, most people would maybe say Adho Mukh Swanasana. So for everyone else, downward facing dog. I'm saying, I'm using that because it's such a, you know, everyone knows it, downward facing dog. Um, mm -hmm. One thing I, as a little aside, actually most people who will have learned in India, certainly when I learned and that's a while ago, <laughs> mm -hmm. but, um, but they will not have the posture that we know in the West as um, downward dog is actually something that I learned as mountain pose or Parvatasan. Because you can easily imagine when the tip of the mountain is your tailbone and you go down, hands, feet on the ground. Um, and downward dog is where you go a little bit deeper. This is what I learned as downward dog, where the crown of the head or the forehead come down towards the ground. Very different, very different postures. Similar, but very different as well. And um, so this as a side, I know I'm, I'm going off piece, but I'm coming back. Adho Muk Shwanasan makes so much sense when you know the language a little bit, because mm -hmm. it's the different little um, words that all make up the whole. So Adho Muk Shwanasana makes no sense because it's like um, saying a sentence, but not making the, uh, not pausing in between the words. And maybe to the point where you don't know where did one word end and the other one start. But when you say adho muk swan asan, then you know exactly we're talking about downward facing dog. And that's the same with many others. So the, you know, I, I often, and many people, um, I, I've kind of come to do it as well because it's easier. <laughs> um, I, um, I now often say chaturanga instead of chaturanga dandasan. So that low plank where we're using the tricep, bringing the elbows in towards us from a plank. And um, if we're saying chaturanga, that is quite far removed from the actual asan name and the pronunciation because it's chatur, the four from, you know, the Sanskrit four, yeah. the limbs and dand, that flat, that, that um, plank, yeah, plank. So there we have it. That's where it comes from, the four-limbed staff pose. That's the, you know, what, what the English translation would be. And, um, and I think sometimes I, I would wish for people to look more at the Sanskrit, maybe learn a little bit of Sanskrit, because then the beauty of the language and ultimately the beauty of the asana itself comes through a little bit more. Because when we understand what we're actually doing, in Sarvangasan is the same. Why is the shoulder stand called Sarvangasan? Because Sarv is whole, entire, and Ang is the limbs. Because in Sarvangasan, in our shoulder stand, all of the limbs are not being forgotten, are being used. So I think that's why I just, I love the Sanskrit. I'm not a Sanskrit scholar. I, I know very little. Um, and I think, you know, the more I learn, the more I notice how, how little I actually know and how much I need to and then you come from one thing to the other and and it's never ending but that's also nice that that there is no end to knowledge that that you yes. can keep learning um so yes this would be um one and the um a similar one would be om actually om or om is you know the the sound of our creation and it's very natural to us when we chant om this is our voice and when we, when we close our eyes, so San Mukhi Mutra, where we bring the fingers here on top of our face and we close the ears with our thumbs, um, we're completely inside our own body. And there are certain meditations where, you, um, where you're meditating the cosmos into your body. I think that's, yes, I think I could describe it as that. You're finding the entire universe inside your body. And I don't mm -hmm that in the class but um there's also the story of um lord krishna when he was a little boy um so for those who um don't know um krishna was is the, the reincarnation of a god and um was brought into the world to um to help out in the 
an epic battle between two, um, well, actually family members. But, uh, but basically, Krishna, um, it was said that when he opened his mouth, you could see the entire cosmos in his mouth. And I like that idea because in the Mahabharata and in the Bhagavad Gita as well, because they're not actually, we can come to that later, but they're, um, they're full of metaphors and um, tell us much more about the human body than we actually think when we first look at the story. They are stories, but they're more than that. So there is one story where um, a, a little baby is in his mother's tummy and is very aware of what's going on around him. And the mother is sitting with all the men and they are discussing a, um, a you know, theoretical um, war theater, a situation in war and discussing how to get out of this situation alive. And unfortunately, that little boy who isn't born yet is still in his mother's tummy, falls asleep. And, um, and at that particular moment, he misses the solution to the problem. And he finds himself years later when he's a grown man in the battle of Kurukshetra, in that battle I just mentioned. Um, uh, so this is the story of Abhimanyu. Uh, he finds himself in exactly this situation but he loses his life. He dies because he didn't know how to come out of the situation because he missed when he was in his mother's tummy, the solution to the problem. So there is many, many, and you can see that as just a story, but you can also go back to it and look at, did these people who write the Mahabharata, did yogis back then, were they the first neuroscientists? Did they know what happened when the brain starts to, what happens in a, in a child's brain before that child is born? What synapses are there? What, when is the brain starting to, when are we aware? When does awareness start? So all of this I find extremely fascinating. And um, sorry, to come back to Om, this sound of creation, it's um, very significant because of the way that you write it, everything in it, um, Present, represents something else. It presents the conscious, it presents the unconscious, it presents the subconscious, and it also presents, represents um, a fourth state of consciousness. So we, um, sh through even just the look of um, Om and through chanting Om, we are shedding all of the, uh, the veils in front of our eyes and becoming and transcending again we're back to enlightenment so it starts with as little as om and if you know how to read sanskrit that's just beautiful and i would i would urge everyone to to start maybe with just a little bit of sanskrit i mean not everyone likes learning languages and i completely you know understand that but if you have an affinity towards maybe also creativity and writing if you like drawing it's such a beautiful thing to write and sanskrit actually means perfectly created and this is another one which isn't you know when we're talking about pronunciations actually the pronunciation of sanskrit is either sanskriti or sanskruta so a little bit different as well and it's it's creative it's mathematical it's very specific, it's very accurate, very clear, and it's just, it, it opens up a whole new world for you. But maybe all languages do that to a certain degree. <laughs> uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe Sanskrit is the oldest language in the world. I think so too, I think so too, but who knows? <laughs> yeah. As far and as... <laughs> Yeah, and the story is so fascinating. Like one day when I'm, when I do get pregnant, I'm going to, finish all the stories <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and wake up wake up your baby move a little bit make sure that yeah. <laughs> did you listen this was the end <laughs> don't miss that <laughs> and it's another thing that i find so fascinating because i often find that science is catching up with all these things that yoga already knew so um yeah. often when people ask me but is this backed up by science? I will be honest and say, no, this might not be backed up by science, but it might soon be. Because we don't know how much got lost along the way. Because yoga and uh, even now, the Indian tradition is not to write things down. 
that was never done. A guru would teach one person, teach them everything, every day, day in, day out, until they knew it all, until all the knowledge was passed on and the guru wasn't needed anymore. And that knowledge wasn't written down. That writing down came much later. And I think when you don't write things down, a lot of things get lost as well. Even if you write them down, they get lost. So we don't know what the yogis, the rishis in their caves knew back then, so many years ago. And maybe we're just playing catch up. So that's something that I'm always respectful of. And even if I don't know the answer to something, I'm, I, I, I'm always hesitant to just dismiss something, no matter what it is. Even sometimes things might seem a little bit strange to you, or maybe the way that people uh, um, explain something will sound very basic to you and doesn't make sense. For example, I've heard a lot of people say you store a lot of emotions um, in your hips or, ah, yes, yeah. you are very tight. You must um, have had a serious trauma in your childhood. Now, this is, of course, very, very simplified. But there is, a, there is truth to the fact that, of course, we are very much, our emotions are part of our body, our physical body. They don't just, they're not up here. You know, the, everything up here goes down here. Everything down here is up here. The gut is our second brain. Everything is constantly interacting with each other. And when we're stressed, as we all know, this is not just the adrenaline and cortisol pumping through our body. It is also a physical re reaction. Our body is getting ready to fight that tiger in the wild. And it has to tense up all the muscles. So when we're always stressed, we're always tensing the muscles. We're never relaxing. What happens? Of course, we get all sorts of problems in the body. So that's just something um, to, to keep in mind, that there's much more interconnections than we, than we think maybe when we first look at things. So I, yeah, I like that holistic approach. And um, maybe there is much more than we still, that we still need to learn. And, and there's the wave that now says, this is what happens to stress when mothers are pregnant, um, and they are stressed, then this has the effect on the body and they can now show it through all sorts of MRIs, CT scans, etc. can show what is going on in the brain. But back then, we didn't need that. We already knew it, maybe. Yeah, and now it's also an aside that reaffirmed to me. I'm not going to make any notes anymore. <laughs> I'm just going to listen and try and absorb. Because <laughs> then you I would only... Yeah, I, I would always like always be writing everything down. And if that's not how they learned, and, and then I sort of changed the way I learn over time, I stopped writing so much, because I never look back and I read it. Yeah. Now, is that how they learned? They never took any notes? It's very interesting. No, and, and I think it's, it's a funny thing, because we sort of, it's almost like we're outsourcing that to the paper that we're writing on. And I'm very guilty. of it. I remember actually in um, at my university, um, yeah. I, doing a course on investigative journalism and um, the guy who was teaching me I think we had a chat about you know my my project and everything and um, I kept taking notes and at some point he said you take a lot of notes try to take fewer notes and I thought but I'll forget but he had a point because you can't take that many notes and still be aware the more you listen the more it will again be stored in the brain the more you write the less will be stored in the brain because you've immediately outsourced it goes to the motor cortex rather than being trans um yeah um transferred into your in, into your brain into your memory but that yes makes I, sense. I hold my hand up i do it all the time i have to do lists mm. I don't, and I, I'm worried I'll forget. <laughs> yeah, I know, me too, I also have, yeah. <laughs> and, oh, and you've already answered the question, because someone asked, can you share some fascinating facts about Sanskrit, the Sanskrit language? And you've shared so many um, interesting facts. Um, if there's anything else that you'd like to add, please feel free yeah. about Sanskrit facts. Um... Fascinating yeah, I mean, I, I think the more I think about yog and the, the interconnectedness of um, mudras, for example, and Sanskrit, I think that would be my last, but I've said this before, I think. Everything we do has, has an effect on the brain and on the architecture of our brain. So if you're constantly, sorry, this is going off Sanskrit, but um, 
if if you say okay if we if we speak sanskrit if we say these sanskrit words that will have an effect on our brain if we keep saying them if we chant a mantra for example that will also have an effect on the brain and over and over again it will lead us to a very different way of looking at the world so um kirtan chanting would be the same there's you know there's there's not an overload so this is um also interesting um there's you know we could speak about music in in you because i think nowadays everyone adds music and if i don't um teach with music i i'm asked can you can you do another one of your playlists and um and i think this music has to be chosen very very carefully and it has to be well judged it also also depends on where you're teaching who is your audience what is your aim with the class but um kirtan bhakti yoga mantras the, um would be um uh, are also leaving this imprint on the brain and listening to music when we listen to music brain waves move from high beta of that normal waking consciousness down into the meditative and the trance inducing the alpha and the mm -hmm. that and um then yeah your stress hormones um you know the adrenaline cortisol drop and your reward chemicals dopamine serotonin endorphin oxytocin spike so that's beautiful that's that's a great start and um sanskrit is similar it calms the body it calms the mind and the more we speak it in the right way of course um the more this will have a lasting effect on the brain so that we don't just feel good for the moment in which we're breathing and we're speaking the words but we're changing our neural passageways lastingly so you could imagine it like um uh i don't know a forest in which no one has ever walked and you are walking this as a pioneer and you keep walking that same path same path same path at some mm -hmm. point even though you haven't created a road you haven't put your mind to it and made this road there will be a pathway because you have been treading this path so often and then you could go a different path and do the same there and the more we talk sanskrit the more we in other words as well it's not just sanskrit the more we are kind the more these neural passageways are going to fire automatically without us reverting to something that might be our default so if we're constantly stressed then we'll always be stressed if we're not trying to do something against that if we're not trying to calm ourselves down then our mind will know no different than that path that's always walking just like the autopilot that we have when we walk to work or whatever it is if someone told us oh there's a much quicker way to get to your work here there's there's a you know there's there's this way you just cut through here and then you you spare yourself 5 minutes your mind will have to adjust it won't immediately be like okay this is now my no my new way it will have it will need time and it will need reminder so this is how we can change our mind's architecture our brain's architecture Through singing, That's Sanskrit. Sanskrit. <laughs> Through singing Sanskrit, okay. And also, I've also decided in my life that I'm going to move a bit more to incorporate more, um, to release my fascia if I don't have the, if I don't make the time. Yeah, an endorphin. So I'm going to speak like this as I. <laughs> If I don't have two and a half hours to dedicate it to my yoga practice, I'm gonna be doing yoga practice while I'm and animating my uh, sentences a bit more. <laughs> But thank you, that was such a. Now I should start maybe singing, you know, to communicate to people. <laughs> And I'm like, why are you singing? I said because I'm trying to change my neural pathways and put myself in a more relaxed state because I'm stressed so much. And just your yeah. own voice, your own voice will always calm you because your own voice is always with you. It's so it will yeah. never speak into you. So whether it is, um, you know, Brahmi Pranayam, uh, the humming bee, where we just hum out and then we hum in, mm -hmm. the humming out, um, such a calming thing to do. But any type of singing, and I'm sure everyone will know that. You know, we'll we'll hum along to our favorite song. but we won't do that if we're stressed or if we're if our mind is elsewhere if we're not in the mood we're not going to hum just like a child will never skip along if they're unhappy that doesn't happen <laughs> so yeah. we're 
when we sing and I love singing. I am, um, yeah, I do a lot of singing. In fact, I probably, I, I sometimes say to my husband, I'm really sorry, this must be really annoying to you because I just hum away and I, I don't even realize it anymore. <laughs> he doesn't mind, thankfully. This is... <laughs> <laughs> Did you sing... Actually, I remember you telling me you were housemates with your husband. So did he know you sang, you sang before he married you? <laughs> um, he knew, yes. So I had mentioned that I had. So I have classical singing training, opera singing training. Um, wow. 18. And then I went on in, in London as well. I did some singing, not much. Um, but I, yes, I, I love singing. And um, when I created this, um, this children's television series, actually, it, it morphed into something else. But it's basically... Um, a series for um, you know for small children to to teach them yoga essentially to teach them holding of postures and breathing properly and calming them down so that they have the tools to calm themselves because I realize that often parents you know it's like a family is a microcosm a microorganism it's like a whole one body and when when the let's say the the mother is the prefrontal cortex if we're stressed here then something will happen in the belly the the father so we're we're um interconnected which means that if one person in a family is stressed that will reflect on the other part of the family and then one thing leads to another and they stress each other so it was in a way for me to try and give these children the tools to come out of their so-called tantrums even though i don't like to call it tantrums because i think there's far too much going on in terms of a little child and a lot of hormones and not being able to see the world and, and uh, for what it is because they don't know the world yet and being left alone essentially and then having parents that are understandably also stressed because having children is stressful. So, um, so uh, I did the series and I worked actually with, uh, with singing um, and there was, um, there was one song that basically um, I kind of, yeah, composed and, and then sang and it, it kind of became something else in the end with more folk tales. Do you want to sing it for us? Ah, <laughs> all right, okay. <laughs> but this is not going to be a beautiful voice now. <laughs> no, 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 just sing whatever comes from your heart. Okay, so it would start with us um, standing in tree pose. Uh -huh. yes. so oh. One of my favorites. And um, we would breathe in deeply and then sing together. There once was a tree on the hill. And then that would be sung again, once me, and then the ch children would join. Can I, can I be your student? Oh, yes, okay. okay. All right. Okay, okay. you think I copy you. <laughs> there once was a tree on the hill. And then we'll sing together. There, there once, once was a tree on the hill. But now me. It's branches wood and keep still. And then we would do this. We'll move a little bit. And we'll okay. sing again. It's branches, it's branches wood and keep still. Good. And then it would go. The wind did love the tree so much. And then we'll sing it together. The wind did love the tree so much. Good. And then we'll breathe in and breathe out through the mouth. So that's that wind that is blowing. Ah, now I have to think. This is, was a long time ago now. Um, it flew and it blew with the softest touch. I think that was the line. It flew and it blew with the softest touch. And then at the end. And the tree said hello to the wind. And, the, and tree. the tree said hello to the wind. Yeah. 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 And that were, was so were... good. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. And, okay, but Santi, I am only conscious of time because I don't oh, want to lose the recording. No, no, I don't want to lose the recording. So can you please but just... We'll end it here, but I would love to speak to you again um, to continue. But can you please tell people, because um, I don't know how long that I can go for before I can record it and then, mm -hmm. you know, save it. So can you please tell people how they can contact you, contact you for this part of the video? Ah, very good. Um, <laughs> so why don't they just um, send me a message on, um, on Instagram, either a comment, or a message and it's at Patek Yoga. Should I just add that in the comments? 
Hold on. Uh, yeah, if you can, you can write that. But I will add it. Um, it will be on my page as well. Ah, uh, okay, brilliant. Okay, I've done it anyway. I found You've done it now. Doing this, I'm the least oh technical God. person and terrible on Instagram as well. But no, 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 that was perfect. You did it. <laughs> And um, thank you so much for sharing this information. I know it, you have such an enormous, ginormous array of looking at these aspects. And I am just in absolute awe. I'm so, so, so grateful for your time, for you sharing this. I'm not done. Can I please contact you after I finish this? I'm just going to end it and then I'll like message you. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. So <laughs> Thank you for all your questions, everyone. Stay tuned. We'll be back. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> See you.